So I uh, sent you an email yesterday about the take home quiz that's posted on Learning Suite. So I would encourage you to uh, start that uh, as soon as possible, like the spectroscopy take home quiz. It is uh, comprised of challenge level problems. And so the problems might take you some time. How long it will take you will depend on whether or not you get stuck on any of those problems, uh, which I cannot predict. But uh, uh, if you start early enough, and you get stuck on a problem, you have the ability to set it aside and then come back to it. So um, the material for the fourth problem, that's going to be in our next chapter, lipids, which we'll finish on Wednesday. Uh, so you can wait for that, but you can go ahead and, and work on the first three problems that you see uh, on that take-home quiz, and that'll be due in class next Friday. Uh, and it is an open book, open notes quiz. Uh, but it is not open uh, study partner. You have to work on your own. Uh, it's not open internet, except for the ebook and the learning suite page. Okay, you're not uh, going to look up, try to find the problems somewhere on the internet. Uh, uh, so, so don't do that. Um, uh, but it is, uh, you're free to use your textbook and your class notes. Any questions on the take home quiz? Okay, so today we will finish our discussion of carbohydrates. We're going to start out talking about disaccharides and polysaccharides. Uh, then we will uh, discuss some nitrogen containing uh, carbohydrates. Uh, and then we'll conclude with a discussion of glycolysis or how our body gets energy from glucose. Okay. Uh, so on the screen here, we have a sample disaccharide. This is maltose. Uh, maltose is a component of barley. Uh, it can also be formed by hydrolysis of starch. Uh, malt is the name that is given to the liquid derived from barley. And so maltose is a major component of that. Uh, and you see that our uh, monosaccharides are linked together by a glycoside bond to form a disaccharide. And so this is an alpha glycoside. We know the difference between alpha and beta glycosides. Uh, to describe the glycoside bond between maltose, we need to go further than just saying it is an alpha glycoside. Uh, in this case, we would call it an alpha 1,4 prime glycoside because we have to mention which carbons are linked together uh, to make that disaccharide. And so the one is referring to carbon one on the monosaccharide that is involved in the glycoside that has the acetal. Okay, so it's at the anomeric carbon, carbon one of our aldose. Uh, and then the prime is used on the numbers of the sugar that is not the glycoside. This one has a hemiacetal as opposed to an acetal. It's not the glycoside. Uh, and so the prime numbers here, so one, two, three, four, so you can see that carbon one and carbon four prime are linked together <clears throat> in an alpha fashion at the anomeric carbon of the glycoside. So that's where we get this alpha one four prime nomenclature. So we would refer to maltose as an alpha one four prime glycoside. And maltose, as you can see, is just two units of glucose linked together. Okay, so it's two glucoses linked together in an alpha one four prime fashion. Any questions on our disaccharide and our glycoside nomenclature? So is maltose a reducing sugar? Okay, I see some heads nodding. Yes, maltose is a reducing sugar. Even though it doesn't have a hemiacetal here, it does have one here, okay? So if it has a hemiacetal, and it's an aldose, it's a reducing sugar. It's capable of being oxidized by Tollens reagent or Benedict's reagent. Will maltose undergo mutarotation? Okay, I see heads nodding again. Uh, indeed, maltose will undergo mutarotation. So we're gonna have a mixture of alpha and beta anomers here. They're showing the beta, uh, but, but you would have a mixture here because of the mutarotation. Uh, of course, there's no mutarotation here because it's an acetal. But just like we learned, you can cleave glycosides, you can hydrolyze glycosides, simple glycosides using uh, aqueous acid. 
Uh, we can also hydrolyze or cleave uh, glycosides in disaccharides using aqueous acid. So if we treated maltose uh, with aqueous acid, typically HCl in water, we would uh, cleave that and we would end up with two molecules of glucose as a result. It would just be the glycoside hydrolysis mechanism that we learned earlier in the chapter with simpler glycosides. Okay. Any questions on maltose and its chemistry? Okay, we'll look at another disaccharide, one that you've heard of, lactose. Lactose, of course, is present in milk and other dairy products. There are two differences between lactose and maltose. One is shown right here. So lactose has a beta glycoside bond, right? This is pointing up. The glycoside is cis to the primary alcohol in our chair. Uh, so lactose is going to have a beta glycoside. Like maltose, it is connecting carbon one of the sugar involved in the glycoside with carbon four prime in the sugar that is not involved in the glycoside. So instead of being an alpha one four prime glycoside, it is a beta one four prime glycoside, okay? And the second difference between lactose and maltose is in the identity of the monosaccharides. Well, this one is glucose, this one is not. What is this sugar? It's one of the ones you should know. Is it an epimer of glucose? What carbon is it an epimer at? One, two, three, four. C4 epimer of glucose, what's that? That is galactose. So lactose has one galactose and one glucose linked together by a beta 1,4 prime glycoside bond. And it is the galactose that is involved in the glycoside, uh, whereas the glucose has the free hemiacetal. And they're showing it as the beta anomer here. So is lactose a reducing sugar? Yes, it is. Uh, does galactose undergo mutarotation? Uh, yes, it does. Okay. So I told you that we can cleave glycosides with aqueous acid like HCl. Uh, we usually don't have such low pH in our body. So if our body needs to cleave uh, lactose, it's going to use an enzyme to do that. And the enzyme that cleaves lactose is known as lactase. So if you are lactose intolerant, then your body's lactase uh, is deficient. It does not function properly. You are unable to digest lactose, uh, which makes it very unpleasant for you if you uh, drink milk or ingest other products that have lactose in it. So let's look at a third disaccharide, another one that you've heard of before. Uh, this is sucrose. Okay. So sucrose uh, has uh, a couple of differences uh, relative to maltose and lactose. Uh, we have a glucose here, uh, but this sugar is a ketose. How do we know this is a ketose? So the anomeric carbon has no hydrogen atom. The anomeric carbon here has a hydrogen, so that's an aldose. This anomeric carbon has no hydrogen, so that tells us it is a ketose. Which ketose do you think this is? You can take a guess and you'll be right. It is fructose, right? That's the important ketose. Uh, so sucrose is made up of one unit of glucose and one unit of fructose. Uh, and then the way it is linked together is unusual. So you can see we have an alpha 1, 2 prime glycoside. But because the second sugar is a ketose, carbon 2 is a ketone, right? So we have a glycoside linkage that is linking both anomeric carbons. So both anomeric carbons are involved in one glycoside. This is different from what we have in mannose. And, or in maltose and lactose, okay? So 
Is sucrose a reducing sugar? No, it is not. There's no hemiacetal, so it's not a reducing sugar. We have two acetals, as they pointed out nicely. Will uh, sucrose undergo mutarotation? No, it will not. There's no hemiacetal, no mutarotation. Okay? Of course, you can cleave sucrose uh, with strong acid uh, in water, and that will give you fructose and glucose, uh, or enzymes in our body will, will do the same thing. Okay? So, so the key things with these disaccharides uh, is being able to uh, identify the sugars that are involved as well as uh, identifying the type of glycosidic linkage, um, alpha, beta, uh, and then whatever numbers to put there. Uh, and then also being able to determine whether or not a disaccharide is a reducing sugar or not. Uh, will it undergo mutarotation? Okay. Any questions about disaccharides? So let's look at some polysaccharides. These are longer chains uh, of carbohydrates linked together. And first we'll look at two polysaccharides that we've already looked at in class before, cellulose and amylose. We looked at these back in chapter five in 351M. Uh, and now that we've learned about carbohydrates, we understand more about the structural differences between cellulose and amylose. They're both polysaccharides comprised exclusively of glucose units. But you can see that in cellulose, we've got these beta-1,4 prime linkages, whereas in amylose, we've got the alpha-1,4 prime linkages. Uh, and that single difference uh, is what makes the difference in the structures of these materials as well as their functions. What is cellulose part of? Where do you find it in nature? Plants, cell walls, wood, and cotton uh, are two materials that are primarily made up of cellulose. So because of the beta-1,4 prime linkages, we have these extended strands. Uh, they are somewhat helical. They will curve on each other, as we can see in this molecular model. Uh, but because they're strands, they're not really coiled, they can pack closely together. Uh, and how would two or more strands of cellulose uh, associate with each other? Hydrogen bonds. They would form hydrogen bonds to each other. Uh, and so these strands hydrogen bonded together will make cellulose fibers. Uh, those fibers are going to be fairly tough. Uh, you can't really stretch them out because the chains are already stretched. Uh, and so your wood, uh, you're going to have a hard time bending and stretching that, for example. Uh, so very, very uh, tough material, a structural biopolymer. Uh, does cellulose dissolve in water? No, it does not, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, I don't think you would want your cotton t-shirts dissolving uh, when you do the laundry. Uh, that would be a problem. It would be a real problem if trees dissolved when it rained. Uh, so, so this is good. But why does it not dissolve in water? I mean, they have OHs on every carbon. It's violating our rule of solubility here for cellulose to not dissolve in water. Yes, Grace. Yes, the OH groups are involved in hydrogen bonds to other uh, cellulose strands. Uh, and so very few of those OH groups are available to hydrogen bond to water. Exactly. Some of them are. So uh, cotton fabric will absorb moisture. So if you get your cotton fabric wet, water on the surface can be absorbed into the material through hydrogen bonding to some of those OHs. Uh, but you will not have enough hydrogen bonding between water and those OHs to actually dissolve the material. Uh, and as I mentioned, that's a good thing. Nobody wants plants and trees to dissolve. Uh, nobody wants their cotton shirts uh, to dissolve either. Okay? All right, in contrast... If we look back at amylose, which is one of the components of starch, uh, we have these alpha-1,4 prime linkages that give it a coiled shape. Okay? Uh, what is amylose or starch used for in nature? Energy. Right? It's a source of energy. Uh, we get that energy from the individual glucose units, uh, as we'll talk about in a moment or towards the end of class. 
Um, and so uh, it would be uh, ideal if we could put more of these glucose units in a, a given individual space. And so having the ability to form a coil allows uh, our bodies to pack more glucose molecules uh, in, a, in a given volume of space uh, than we would if it were extended like cellulose. Uh, and we can have hydrogen bonds across this coil that would kind of help hold that three-dimensional shape, but not all of the OH groups are going to be involved in that. And so you have more OH groups um, available for hydrogen bonding to water, which is what allows amylose uh, and starch to dissolve in water. So there is um, another form, uh, a branched form, uh, known as amylopectin that is also part of starch. About roughly 20% of starch will be amylose, which is the straight chain molecule. Uh, and then about 80% of starch will be amylopectin, uh, which is the branched form of starch. And so the branches come off of C6. So you have alpha-1,6 prime glycosides coming off of some of the primary alcohols on our glucose uh, subunits. Uh, and so the branching serves two purposes. One is it allows more glucose units to be packed in a given volume. So that's more efficient storage of energy to be able to fit more glucose molecules in, in a given space. Uh, the other is that it increases the rate at which our body can break down starch to generate glucose molecules. So uh, I mentioned that uh, we generally don't have strong acid available in the body. Uh, and so if we want to cleave these glycosides, we need enzymes to do it. Okay. So the enzymes that are going to be cleaving our starch molecules are known as alpha glucosidase. So glucosidase is referring to the fact that they're cleaving these glucose based biopolymers. And the alpha tells us that they're cleaving the alpha glycosides. So we have this enzyme. Most organisms have this enzyme. Question? So right here? Yeah. So you've got the alpha 1,4 primes that are part of the main chain. And then you've got the alpha 1,6 prime that connects the branches to the chain. So there's another enzyme called beta-glucosidase. Beta-glucosidase is the enzyme that cleaves beta-glycoside linkages in glucose polymers. So that would cleave cellulose. If you ever tried to eat wood or cotton when you were a kid, you found out the hard way that we don't have this enzyme. Uh, our bodies cannot digest cellulose. Uh, so uh, it's much less common in nature. Termites have it. Uh, and uh, bacteria that live inside the stomachs of cows have it. Uh, but there's not a ton of organisms that have this enzyme. Uh, but we have this one. And I don't know that that's a bad thing. Somebody asked in the other class, well, why do we not have that? I don't know. Uh, but I'm not complaining because I don't really want to eat wood or cotton. So uh, I'm happy to just have the alpha glucosidase. So uh, when these enzymes break down these biopolymers, they have to start at the end of the chain, and they just cleave off one glucose molecule at a time. So if you have a bunch of branches, you have a lot more ends to your chains. Uh, and so you're getting more glucose molecules in a shorter amount of time uh, from digesting a branched form of starch as opposed to a linear form of starch. So amylopectin is more efficient in terms of space uh, as well as in terms of the rate at which glucose molecules are generated. And there's an even more highly branched form known as glycogen. Glycogen is technically not part of starch. It's technically considered another type of, of material. I'm not sure where the cutoff is between amylopectin and glycogen, but if you have even more branches, uh, then it is referred to as glycogen, uh, which is our most efficient way of storing glucose. We store it as glycogen, uh, and then when the body needs energy, alpha-glucosidase uh, jumps into action and starts chewing on all of the ends of those chains. Okay?
Any questions about our metabolism of starch? Okay, so uh, let's talk now about a class of carbohydrates known as amino sugars. As the name suggests, amino sugars contain nitrogen. So we'll draw for you probably the most common amino sugar. We drew our squiggly line here just as a shorthand way of showing it's a mixture of alpha and beta anomers. So this sugar is called glucosamine. If you look at the way I drew it, hopefully you can recognize that it's got the same stereochemistry as glucose. We've just replaced one of the OHs. In this case, it's the one at C2. We replaced one of the OHs with uh, an amine, okay? Uh, so glucosamine uh, is common in nature. Uh, it is actually common at uh, pharmacies and nutrition stores. It's sold as a nutritional supplement. Uh, does anybody know what glucosamine uh, is reportedly good for? Anybody used it before? So athletes uh, will tend to take glucosamine. It is believed to have a positive impact on your cartilage to help rebuild your cartilage. Uh, so if you've put wear and tear on your knees, on your elbows, on your shoulders, uh, then it is thought that uh, glucosamine can kind of help uh, rebuild uh, some of that cartilage. Whether it does or not, I'm not certain, but, uh, uh, but it is definitely sold for that purpose. So uh, uh, amino sugars are often present in nature as amides, okay? So if we make an amide, if we add an acetyl group to that nitrogen, we get N-acetyl glucosamine. That has two names. Sometimes it's abbreviated GLUNAC. Sometimes it's abbreviated as NAG, okay? Uh, and N-acetylglucosamine is incorporated into a variety of polysaccharides. Uh, one of the most common ones is shown here known as chitin. So chitin is a polysaccharide uh, comprised of N-acetylglucosamine units linked together in a beta-1,4 prime linkage. So it looks an awful lot like cellulose, and it is similar to cellulose. We've just replaced the C2OHs on each sugar with an amide, okay, and acetylglucosamine. So um, does anyone know where chitin is found in nature? Anyone heard of chitin? Yes, Ben. Yes, lobster shells, crab shells, exactly. So chitin forms exoskeletons in nature. Lobsters, crabs, shrimp. So you can see some similarity to cellulose. Right? Cellulose is a fairly rigid, fairly tough material. It's not water soluble. You'll have those same properties in chitin because you'll have a similar sort of uh, fibrous shape to the molecule. Uh, and those fibers will be able to hydrogen bond to each other. Okay. Uh, so water insoluble, that's great. Uh, I'm sure that lobsters and crabs wouldn't want their exoskeletons dissolving uh, in the ocean. Uh, that wouldn't be very helpful. Uh, but you can see that uh, for reasons I can't explain, my knowledge in this area is limited, replacing the OH groups that you have in cellulose at C2 with these amides makes the material even harder and tougher than what you have with cellulose. Okay, So you get increased... Uh, rigidity. So you have some similarities to cellulose, not water soluble. Um, you get these fibers, these bundles of fibers, hydrogen bonded together. Uh, but but having these uh, these amides here makes that material even tougher uh, than what you have with cellulose. Okay. So another place we find amino sugars uh, is on the surface of our red blood cells. Uh, here we have a figure showing us the blood antigen determinants. So 
uh, in our bodies, we have biopolymers called glycoproteins. As the name suggests, a glycoprotein is a blend of a protein and a carbohydrate. It's going to have a protein portion and a carbohydrate portion. Usually with glycoproteins, you have small carbohydrate chains coming off of a longer amino acid chain. Okay? Glycoproteins have a variety of roles in nature, uh, but uh, they are often found on the surfaces of cells where the protein part is going to be inside the cell membrane, uh, and then the carbohydrate part is poking out into the cytosol. Okay? Uh, and these blood antigen determinants are found on the surfaces of our red blood cells, and they determine our blood types. So just small variations in the carbohydrate portion of those glycoproteins determines our blood type. And you see that they all have N-acetylglucosamine, there's N-acetylglucosamine. And then they all have galactose here. Okay. Uh, and then they differ in this third sugar. They all have this branch. This is an unusual sugar here. This is an L sugar. If you look at the way the chair is drawn, it's flipped compared to these other chairs. That tells us it's an L sugar. And it's an L-deoxy sugar. It has a methyl group instead of a primary alcohol. It's actually called fucose. We're not going to focus on fucose. What we're going to focus on is this third sugar in the linear chain. So in type A blood, you have uh, galnac, or N-acetylgalactosamine. In B type blood, you just have uh, galactose there instead of its amino sugar. And then in O type blood, you're missing that piece. Okay? And if you have type AB, then you're going to have a mixture of these two. Uh, and so we have antibodies uh, in our body that are designed to recognize red blood cells and determine if they are from us or if they are some sort of foreign invader. Uh, and so you have antibodies designed to recognize your own blood type. Right? But since O is missing this one, it can, it can get away and, and, and not be detected as a foreign invader in many cases. So that's kind of a simplified version uh, of blood types, uh, we're not talking about the, the, the RF factor, or, you know, what makes it positive or negative, uh, but these, this different pattern of uh, carbohydrates on your glycoproteins is what determines your blood type. Any questions? Okay, so um, another type of nitrogen-containing uh, carbohydrate uh, is known as an N-glycoside. So we can take a monosaccharide, such as glucose, we can react glucose with an amine. We're just going to use a simple amine in this case, uh, ethyl amine. We can use mild acid. Uh, and what will happen is we will attach this amine to the anomeric carbon. We'll convert our hemiacetal into a species known as a hemiaminal. And we're going to have both alpha and beta. So this species that has an amine at the anomeric carbon is known as an N-glycoside. Okay. So the mechanism of forming an N-glycoside is the same as the mechanism of forming a normal glycoside. You're just using the amine as the nucleophile as opposed to using the alcohol as the nucleophile. So we're going to protonate this oxygen, lose water, our amine will attack, and then we do a proton transfer. So we could draw the mechanism. We'll get a mixture of alpha and beta uh, because uh, we'll have that planar intermediate and the amine can attack from above or below. Uh, why do you think we're using mild acid in this case? 
uh, which is defined as either a low concentration of strong acid uh, or, or a normal concentration of a weaker acid. What would it, yes? Yeah, if you remember when we were forming imines and enamines, we were using an amine as a nucleophile. We didn't want that nitrogen to be fully protonated because then it would no longer be a nucleophile. And that's the problem here too. So we just need enough acid to, to, to generate enough of that, that, that cation, but not so much that we've tied up our nitrogen fully uh, and prevented it from acting as a nucleophile. So N-glycosides uh, are common uh, in nature. Uh, and we'll show you some places where you've seen them before. So when you form an N-glycoside between ribose or deoxyribose, uh, and, and when that nitrogen is coming from a heterocycle, from a cyclic amine, that is referred to as a nucleoside. So here you see a ribonucleoside derived from ribose. And here you see a deoxyribonucleoside derived from deoxyribose, okay? More specifically, 2-deoxyribose, okay? Uh, and you see that these are beta, right? We, these, these are D sugars. The primary alcohol is pointing up. Uh, and we have the nitrogen cis. And so that's a beta glycoside. That's usually what we see in these uh, N-glycosides. Um, so nucleosides can be reacted with, well, first we'll show you this before we show you, show you what I was just talking about. Uh, this just shows you the uh, heterocycles, which are aromatic. We, we talked about these heterocycles actually back in chapter 17 uh, that are involved in the nucleosides that are incorporated into our DNA and RNA. Uh, and the, the parent heterocycles are known as pyrimidines and purines. Uh, and there's three pyrimidines that we find in nature, uh, cytosine, uracil, and thymine. Uh, they all have their, their one-letter abbreviations. Uh, we know that thymine is found in DNA and uracil is found in RNA. Uh, the difference is just this methyl group. That methyl group is missing uh, from uracil, which is in, uh, in RNA. Uh, and then the heterocycles based on purine, adenine, and guanine, uh, both of those are found in, in, in DNA and in RNA. Uh, and it is the nitrogen in red uh, that ends up uh, bonding to the anomeric carbon of the sugar. Okay? So I told you that so uh, ribose and deoxyribose are pentoses. Uh, and I told you that pentoses... Uh, will favor the six-membered cyclic hemiacetal. Uh, if you just dissolve ribose in water, you're going to get more of it in that six-membered pyranose form than you will get in the five-membered furanose form. But I also told you that we usually show ribose in the furanose form because that's the form that is relevant in nature. And it is in nucleosides and nucleotides that we see that five-membered cyclic hemiacetal or that furanose form uh, in nature. And the reason why that five-membered ring is important, uh, why, uh, why in nature we see the five-membered ring rather than the six-membered ring, is when we form the five-membered cyclic hemiacetal, we end up with a primary alcohol. And if we attach a phosphate to the primary alcohol of our five-membered cyclic hemiacetal, we now end up with a nucleotide. Okay, so nucleoside has the primary alcohol. Nucleotide has the phosphate there. Okay, uh, so this is a ribonucleotide. It's ribose. Ribose has those two OHs both pointing down. This is a deoxyribonucleotide. It's missing the C2 alcohol, but they both have phosphate on the primary alcohol. And that phosphate is critical because that phosphate is used to link two different nucleotides together to make a polymer. 
which would either be RNA in the case of ribonucleotides or DNA in the case of deoxyribonucleotides. So we can look here. Uh, this figure is showing us a strand of RNA and a strand of DNA. And so the phosphates are linking uh, C5 on one uh, pentose to C3 on the other pentose. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, of course, in DNA, we don't have the, the two prime alcohol. In RNA, we, we do have that two prime alcohol. We can look here at this figure, uh, and this shows us a couple of things. <clears throat> it shows us that in DNA, those two strands uh, are going to coil on each other uh, and make and have that double helical structure. Uh, and those uh, two strands are going to be held together by hydrogen bonds. Uh, those nitrogen heterocycles are designed to hydrogen bond very well with their partner. You see that uh, guanine and cytosine, G and C, can form three hydrogen bonds to each other, whereas A and T can form two. Uh, in RNA, we replace T with U. That just removes this methyl group. It has no impact on the ability of those hydrogen bonds to form. Okay? So we end up with the, these are flat aromatic molecules. So those hydrogen bonded base pairs uh, tend to be like uh, rungs of a ladder. If you look at this uh, coiled uh, double helix, uh, it's kind of a ladder type of a shape. Uh, and then the backbone, of course, is those phosphates uh, linked together to the monosaccharides, okay? So why five-membered cyclic hemiacetal instead of six? Why the furanose instead of the pyranose? I think there's two reasons. One is to get that primary alcohol that, that, that allows you to get these two sugars the right distance from each other. And then two is the fact that the five-membered rings, they're not totally flat as they appear here, but they are significantly flatter than a six-membered ring. And I think that flatter shape also helps uh, get the right geometry to form uh, uh, DNA and RNA. Here we're seeing uh, what a typical strand of DNA would look like. RNA, by virtue of having that alcohol here, uh, adopts much more diverse conformations. You can have bulges and twists and loops and all kinds of weird structures in RNA. So the structure of RNA is not as well studied as DNA because DNA's structure is much more uniform, okay? So N-glycosides form uh, the backbones of DNA and RNA. Any questions? All right, so now in the remainder of the time we have today, we're going to talk about glycolysis. Glycolysis is known as the catabolism of glucose. And this is not in your textbook. This figure uh, comes from another textbook. After I write this, I'll tell you uh, a little bit about it. So the catabolism of glucose uh, is what glycolysis is. So these figures we're going to use to discuss glycolysis as well as discuss some other uh, biochemical processes in our next chapter uh, come from a textbook called Organic Chemistry with Biological Applications. Uh, in this book, it's written by uh, Professor John McMurray. Um, the actual textbook itself is not really something you would want to invest in, uh, but and I'm not sure if BYU does this anymore or not, but in the bookstore, we used to sell a um, condensed version of this uh, that just has two or three chapters uh, from this book uh, at a much lower cost than the actual full textbook. So um, the full textbook itself, again, not as good as the textbook we use here in class, uh, but what it does do is provide a nice link between organic chemistry and biochemistry. So it discusses glycolysis, um, other uh, metabolic pathways that you would learn about in biochemistry from an organic chemistry perspective. So since most of you will be taking biochemistry next year, uh, if you want to prepare yourself for that over the summer, 
if you can get a hold of the smaller version that we sell, uh, I think it was like 30 to $50 or something like that in the bookstore, much cheaper uh, than several hundred dollars that you would pay for the actual textbook, it would be worth getting a hold of, okay? Uh, but in class, these figures we're going to show you will be on Learning Suite, and they do come from the book. So what does catabolism mean? So the word catabolism... refers to the breakdown of complex molecules into simpler molecules with the release of energy. Okay. So uh, through the glycolysis pathway, our body is breaking glucose down into simpler molecules, and it's releasing energy. Uh, it's not releasing that energy in the form of heat. Uh, what we're doing is we will be generating high-energy molecules that can be used in other processes to release heat. Okay? So let's look at how glycolysis occurs. And I don't want you to memorize this pathway. I just want you to look at each individual step and recognize that it's something we've studied previously, something that we understand already, okay? So we start with glucose. First thing we do is we attach a phosphate to the C6 alcohol, the primary alcohol of glucose. We talked about this back in chapter six. This is known as a coupled reaction. Uh, our bodies do not just take inorganic phosphate and attach it at C6. That would be thermodynamically unfavorable. Uh, but what we do is we couple this to an energetically favorable process, and that is ATP hydrolysis. So we take a phosphate from the end of ATP and stick it on C6, and as a result, we've generated ADP, okay? So we've consumed energy. We're already down one molecule of ATP uh, in this process, but we'll make it up in, in the second phase that I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, so we talked about this reaction back in chapter 6 as an example of a coupled reaction where to accomplish something that's energetically unfavorable, our bodies couple that with a process that's energetically favorable, namely ATP hydrolysis. Okay? And you'll see that in order to help us understand what's happening in each of these individual steps, uh, this figure has helpfully drawn Fisher projections of some of these intermediates, uh, uh, which will, will, will be a little um, more instructive than the actual uh, uh, forms that we see these molecules in, in solution, okay? All right, so once we have uh, glucose 6-phosphate, we're going to convert glucose 6-phosphate into fructose 6-phosphate, okay? How do we do that? How do we convert glucose into fructose? We did talk about this. Okay, we can treat it with base. Uh, we can form an enolate intermediate. We can convert that enolate into an enol. And then because it would be an enediol, we can then tautomerize it into a ketone. Right? We went over that mechanism in class. I think that was Monday, if I remember right. Uh, we could also do that with acid. So, so it says here ketoenol tautomerization. That's what's happening. We can isomerize from the keto form to an enol form using either acid or base. I'm honestly not sure exactly what ha which one happens in the active side of the enzyme. <clears throat> but you could envision protonating the carbonyl first uh, and then deprotonating here second to get to our enol instead of the other way around. And then tautomerizing the enol to a ketone. So that's a step that we've already studied. We studied that earlier in the chapter of how to convert glucose into fructose. Okay. So then once we do that, once we convert glucose to fructose, uh, now we have a new primary alcohol. Fructose has primary alcohols at each end of the chain, C1 and C6. We already stuck a phosphate on C6. Now that we've generated a primary alcohol on C1, step three of glycolysis is to phosphorylate that primary alcohol. Okay? So now we've, uh, and of course that's unfavorable with inorganic phosphate. We have to use ATP as our phosphate source. So now we've burned two molecules, two equivalents of ATP in the process. Okay, so we're down, we're at negative two molecules of ATP in terms of the energetics of the process so far. 
Okay? All right, now here's a key step. Once we get to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, our bodies perform a retroaldol reaction. We learned back in chapter 24 about this very same retroaldol reaction. We told you that retroaldol reactions are common in nature. This is one of the most common ones. Okay? So in a retroaldol reaction, we go to the beta hydroxyl, hydroxyl group beta to our ketone. We deprotonate that beta hydroxyl. We use the electrons in the oxygen hydrogen bond to make a carbonyl. We have to cleave the carbon carbon bond as a process, as part of that, sending those electrons here to make an enolate. So, what we do is we break our six carbon molecule into two three carbon molecules. We'll protonate that enolate. So, we'll get a ketone from this three, these three carbons, that's dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And then we'll get an aldehyde from these three carbons, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Any questions on how that retroaldol reaction occurs? So that's a key step, because that's where we've broken our six-carbon chain into two three-carbon chains. <coughs> now, the way these arrows get down here is kind of confusing. We generate one molecule of each of these by that retroaldol reaction. But what our body needs for the second phase is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So we isomerize the dihydroxyacetone phosphate into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Okay? And how do we do that? Look at these uh, Fisher projections. We've taken a ketone and turned it into an aldehyde. How do we do that? The same way we would isomerize glucose to fructose or fructose to glucose, we go through either an enol or an enolate. Right, so we, <clears throat> we protonate, convert to the enol, which is an enediol, and then we tautomerize that to give the aldehyde. So now we've made two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate in phase one of glycolysis. And we've consumed two molecules of ATP in the process. Any questions? All right, let's go to the second figure here that's going to show us the second half of glycolysis. So the first thing we're going to do is oxidize. So glyceraldehyde has an aldehyde at C1. We learned uh, earlier in class that NAD plus uh, is a cofactor that is used to uh, oxidize alcohols to aldehydes or aldehydes to carboxylic acids in nature. So we oxidize the aldehyde to a carboxylic acid and we generate an acyl phosphate. We learned about acyl phosphates as carboxylic acid derivatives, naturally occurring carboxylic acid derivatives, uh, back in chapter 22, I believe it was. Uh, and so in this case, our bodies are able to use inorganic phosphate. We don't have to burn up another molecule of ATP. Once we get the carboxylic acid from that oxidation, the mechanism of which we've studied earlier, there's a figure that shows that mechanism. We attach phosphate and we have this acyl phosphate species. Okay? Now that acyl phosphate is reactive. Uh, the phosphate on that, uh, that, that acyl group there uh, is able to be transferred to a molecule of ADP. Okay? So now we've actually formed ATP in step seven by transferring the phosphate from this uh, acyl group to ADP. How many molecules of ADP or ATP are we making in this step? We're making two. Why? Because we made two molecules of glyceraldehyde from one molecule of glucose. So from one molecule of glucose, we're actually getting two ATPs in this step. Because there's two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate going through this sequence. Okay. Now... Once we've transferred that phosphate, uh, we now will isomerize from 3-phosphoglycerate to 2-phosphoglycerate. And that simply involves this oxygen attacking the phosphorus, moving the phosphorus over from carbon-3 to carbon-2. That's important because when we do that, that sets us up for our next step, which is a dehydration. We know how dehydrations occur. Right? We're just protonating the oxygen and losing water. Uh, and that gives us a double bond, 
a double bond with a phosphate attached. So that is called an enol phosphate, phosphoenol pyruvate. So it looks like an enol, but it has a phosphate attached. Right? We know that enols are higher in energy than ketones. An enol phosphate is also a higher energy species. It's able to transfer its phosphate to ADP to make more ATP. So that's what happens in our final step of glycolysis. We transfer this phosphate from phosphoenol pyruvate to ADP. How many molecules of ATP are we making in this step? We're making two. So we've made a total of four molecules of ATP. And how many did we consume in the first part? We consume two. So the net result is plus two molecules of ATP. ATP is a high energy molecule. It does not have energy stored in its bonds, as you would be led to believe in a biology class. Okay, No energy stored in the bonds. Right, Breaking bonds uh, costs us energy. It's, it's forming bonds that releases energy. Bond forming is an energetically favorable process. But what happens when we hydrolyze ATP is we get more stable products, uh, meaning that we're forming stronger bonds in the new products and we're breaking weaker bonds in the starting material. So ATP is a high energy molecule because when it reacts, usually we form lower energy products. So that's how the energy is stored. It's not stored in bonds, okay? Uh, but we're making a net result of two molecules of ATP in glycolysis. Uh, and so that's, that's where the energy is going. We're also making pyruvate. Uh, pyruvate can be converted into acetyl coenzyme A. We lose CO2 and we add a thiol, we get acetyl coenzyme A. Uh, that can be metabolized further in the citric acid cycle, which we won't talk about uh, right now. Uh, but acetyl coenzyme A is also used for other biological uh, purposes uh, that we talked about in class uh, for making esters and amines. Okay. So what should you know about glycolysis? Uh, please don't memorize the cycle. I'm not interested in you memorizing the cycle. I'm interested in having you understand each individual step. As we've gone through it and I've explained mechanistically what's happening in those steps, uh, that's what you want to understand. And this is all chemistry we've studied. That's why it's nice to study glycolysis right now, because we've studied all of these reactions at various points in the class, setting us up to put it all together at this point. Any questions? All right, so that concludes our discussion of carbohydrates. Uh, and on Monday, we will start discussing lipids. Have an enjoyable general conference weekend.